edge. The session today is um, being recorded as you've just seen. Um, so if you're just joining us, just know that you are being recorded. Um, so this session happens every Monday evening and it's meant to be an interactive session. So we'll have some time to um, hear from our speakers this evening and then we will open up the floor for Q&A. So you'll be able to ask your questions and, and get the information that you came for today, uh, regardless of whether the presentation addresses it or not. Um, so thanks for being here. We're really glad you've joined us. I do want to start off by telling you a little bit about Edges, a, is where we like to say where impact and entrepreneurship thrive. It is a entrepreneurship hub that's focused on social impact ventures. So people who are um, change makers and using entrepreneurial approaches to solving uh, the challenges of the world, whatever those, those may be in, in the sphere in which our entrepreneurs are working. And uh, so we're thrilled to have you here with us this evening. I would like to let another has been and still is the traditional territory of several indigenous nations, nations including Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, the Métis, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Since time immemorial, numerous Indigenous nations and Indigenous peoples have lived and passed through this territory. We recognize that this territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and the Two Row Wampum Treaty, which emphasizes the importance of joint stewardship, peace, and respectful relationships. Sheridan affirms that it is our collective responsibility to honor and respect those who have gone before us, those who are here, and those who have yet to come. We are grateful for the opportunity to be working and living on this land. So for today, when you're on the call, we would just encourage you to mute out when you're not speaking. We prefer that you share your screen, sorry, that you uh, turn on your webcam so that we can see you. Uh, just helps the presenters when they're, when they're speaking to be able to see who they're talking to. Um, and then if you have any questions, you can type those in the chat box and as I mentioned already, the session is being recorded. So thanks for being here. Our agenda for today is um, we're going to do the welcome and introductions. We'll have the presentation and then we'll do the Q&A. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, sorry. Uh, the speakers today are Mark Simone who's the partner and director of accounts at King Street Media. Mark is a um, partner, sorry, he has been involved at the King Street Media agency for some time. Um, they are a Toronto-based marketing and creative agency focused on purpose-driven growth. So very aligned with the ventures that we have at Edge. Um, the agency provides dedicated services ranging from digital advertising and social media marketing to brand strategy and content creation. Mark started the agency in 2018 after working at Mosaic. He is passionate about telling stories with data. And throughout his career, Mark has worked with national brands such as Walmart, Canadian Tire, and Loblaw, but it's his time spent working with startups, impacting change within their venture that fuels his passion for growth marketing. Kirsten I didn't even ask you, Kirsten, how I say your last name. Kirsten Perry, social media director of King Street Media. Um, she's focused on helping small and medium-sized businesses and organizations make a big impact. She's the social media director at King Street Media, working with a team of social media managers and creatives that support entrepreneurs, brands, and nonprofits. She first began freelancing in 2018 before joining the agency and continues to support and highlight local small businesses in Windsor through her online community only in YQG. Kirsten is passionate about helping small business owners with the tools and education needed to help them thrive in a digital environment. So over to you, Mark and Kirsten. Perfect. So, thank you for the fantastic introduction. I think Kirsten's <laughs> going to uh, present her screen now for us. I am. Just give me the thumbs up or let me know that you can see my screen and we'll be good. We can see it, but there you go. Okay, perfect. 
All right. So today we are talking about social media growth and social media is, I should say, it needs to be part of your overall marketing strategy now more than ever. Honestly, if you asked me this five years ago, I would have said the same thing. And there's still some people out there that aren't utilizing social media in the best way possible for their, their business or their venture. So Obviously, um, Lisa did a nice uh, introduction to KSM, King Street Media, and Mark and I. Oh. So we don't need to go into too many details, but we're going to start with why. Why should you use social media for your venture or your startup? There are a million reasons why, but at the end of the day, everyone right now is on social media in some capacity. Either they're on Facebook and they're interacting with their friends and family. They're on LinkedIn updating their network about their career, excuse me, their career accomplishments or achievements that they have. Maybe they're sharing their political opinions on Twitter or engaging with brands that they like. Regardless, people are on social media and it's almost become its own like search engine. And it's a way that people connect with the brands and the businesses that they're super passionate about. There's a whole list here. I'm not going to go through each one specifically, but just to review some high level um, reasons why it improves your searchability. A lot of times people are going on Instagram or Facebook and searching up the businesses to see if they even have an active profile there. It helps increase brand awareness so that more people become familiar with you, with your business, and at the end of the day, feel more comfortable purchasing from you. It increases your web traffic. It helps you manage crisis communication. If something happens, people are seeing how you're responding to it on social media. You can improve your customer service and your support by being active on those platforms and engaging with your community. And then, of course, it helps you generate leads for your business, which is the whole reason why you're here and really turning your social media presence into something that's actually going to give you return on investment. So now that you know why you should be using social media for your venture or startup, it's important to recognize how you can do that. You may be someone who has a venture or startup that isn't on social media yet, or you may have a profile that exists, but you're not really sure what to do with it. This is going to be a very simple three-step process to get you on social media and building a community that is going to result in leads and a return on investment. With every single client that we work with, we start by building out a social media strategy. There are so many people out there that are using social media without having a clear strategy that guides them in putting out content and engaging with their community. The social media strategy is going to identify your target audience, help you set social media goals, decide what platforms you should actually be on and how often you should be posting, and then also outlining some content pillars or areas of focus that are going to help you in creating your content so that you're not left stuck wondering what on earth you should be sharing. After you have your social media strategy, you are going to create and share your content. And then you want to build a community through community management. So there are so many people out there that are posting on social media, but then they're forgetting to engage with the community that they're building there. They've got followers, their followers maybe like their posts every once in a while, are commenting on their content, but they're not commenting back. They're not sending messages. They're not really building that community and connecting with their audience to foster those relationships and convert those people from being a follower into being a paying customer. So start with strategy. I'm going to hand it over to Mark, who's going to talk about identifying your target audience, which is probably one of the most important first steps that you do not want to miss out on. Yeah, I think. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, when you're building out any business plan, let alone a marketing plan, you want to start with identifying who it is that you're trying to reach. And one very important tactic in, in defining that is figuring out a problem to solve. So the, one of the things that we do with a lot of our clients is we start by saying, what problem is it that I'm trying to solve for my customer? 
And that usually allows you to help understand who these people are. So who is your audience? Outline usually two to three target personas. I may even suggest starting with one or two. Sometimes if you spread yourself too thin, uh, uh, then you can end up not reaching the smallest viable audience and really not focusing your efforts well enough. Start with one problem that you're trying to solve and then one or to two group of people that you think need that problem solved as well. What device are they using? This is as simple as where, like what type of content do you need to create in order to best reach them? Is it, uh, is it the fact that they're, you know, a B2B targeted industry and they're likely to be on their desktop making these high ticket item purchase decisions? Or are they somebody, you know, representative of the 80% of people you're likely going to reach that are using their cell phone to visit your website? So understanding what device they're going to use is going to allow you to better understand what type of content you need to develop and how that needs to look. Um, how frequently are they online and what types of things do they do in their spare time? You know, not all social media platforms, we all know this, are created equal. So uh, somebody in an older demographic is more likely to be engaging with friends and family on Facebook or LinkedIn, especially in a B2B industry, whereas somebody from the Gen Z or millennial age group uh, is better reached on Instagram or Twitter. Um, or even TikTok at, at, uh, at this stage now. So where are they going? Just kind of, where are they online? Uh, uh, we just kind of spoke to that. So being able to understand how you can solve those problems in the place where they need it most. Accessibility is something I'm going to talk a little bit later about even more. And, you know, if you're out there solving a very important problem for a client and they're not hearing about it because they're not spending a lot of time in that place, then that's uh, not, a, not a great way to allocate your resources and efforts. So understanding where your target persona lives online is one of the most key factors in developing a, a true target persona. Uh, and then how niche can you go? I talked about this a little bit earlier. Start with one to two target personas and then start to build from there so that you can identify the smallest viable audience. That way you're not building this massively cast net uh, and really not getting through to anybody because the, the objective is to get people to listen and to be able to help them understand that your business is accessible and is solving problems that they deal with. Continue on there, Kirsten. Here I've given you an example of a target persona, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about some free resources that are accessible to you. Um, but this right here is something that was built on HubSpot. It's a free marketing tool. They're going to take your email and your phone number, and they're going to enter you in their CRM tool. But uh, this is something that is accessible for free. So you're going to go through their quiz funnel and enter the questionnaire to describe a little bit about your customer and that target persona that you want to build, and it's going to pump out this profile. Um, but based off of other research that we were able to find using tools like LinkedIn, I'm, I'm really active on LinkedIn to understand how businesses are targeting customers because you have access to uh, the organization and the details about uh, people who work within the company. But here I've, I've just really built out one. Uh, Adrian's an active millennial. So I've outlined what age group he's in. Uh, he splits his time between work, family, and friends. He is newly married and he moved into his first family home. So we know where he lives and uh, the, the state of his family. Uh, Adrian's looking to plant his roots. So he's a younger guy, but wants to really settle into a community. He is research oriented and values uh, the moral decisions that a business makes, social economical decisions that a business makes. And he also talks about that online with his friends, that that's an important part of his decision-making process. Um, Adrian values accessibility. He is part of the demographic that wants to be able to reach a business. That's why chatbots, direct messages are extremely important. He prefers picking up the phone to call to make a reservation at a restaurant. Um, Adrian likely needs to be reached seven to 11 times by a business before he's going to make that purchase online. So CRM software is incredibly important in order to better reach Adrian. Spends a lot of time on uh, Instagram to hang out with friends and family and LinkedIn to post about business updates. Um, and yeah, he works in financial service and sales agents. So this just gives you a little bit of a breakdown of who Adrian is, how we went about building his persona and uh, a little bit of information on him. All right. I'll talk a little bit about setting goals. Uh, important to remember that not all goals for businesses are created equal. And what I mean by this is that if you're starting out as a brand, you may be looking to just gain notoriety and credibility in a certain area. 
An example of this is, oh, sorry, I thought somebody joined there. An example of this can be that you're trying to let, let's say you've opened a new restaurant and you wanna let as many people in the area know that you exist. You'd likely build out more awareness tactics of your, of your funnel, giving very top line surface information about your brand that's going to allow people to recognize it each time they come across you on social media, especially from an advertising perspective, which we'll talk about more. Next, we have lead generation. Uh, in working in this industry, we recognize that you're, you need to develop a relationship with a customer, especially in the higher ticket industries. So we often implement things like lead magnets. This is where you're going to offer somebody a specific amount of value in exchange for something like a name and a phone number and contact information. This will allow you to get down the funnel with them, develop an online relationship, and ultimately, hopefully, convert them into a customer. Um, you can also define your goals by something as simple as transactions or sales, which you're able to assign a quantifiable dollar amount to and really understand the return on investment and lifetime value of a customer. This is more for established businesses that um, are, or I, I, I could say really any businesses, especially e-commerce based. Uh, and then something as simple, like I think follower, uh, correct me, Kirsten, but follower ties a lot into brand building and awareness, uh, sure. just gaining that notoriety and credibility online. We use this example for, uh, I'll refer again to a restaurant client of ours where you know, part of the value of a franchise restaurant is uh, showcasing their scale and size. So follower growth is actually an extreme priority. We want people to see that they, uh, especially people who are interested in applying for a franchise uh, from, this, from this organization, we want them to see the scale uh, that is this brand. Um, so something like growing follower base is actually a very high priority, even though otherwise, in other cases, it may not seem like that. And then event registrations is, is another example, just like one that we're attending here today. Um, I talked about a little bit about this on the previous slide, so I'll likely speed through this one. But I break down my goals into ultimately three main business objectives, uh, which is obviously grow the brand, build awareness, credibility, and notoriety online through likes, shares, follows, and impressions. Uh, and the advertising world, there's also something called ad recall score, which is the likelihood that somebody's going to recognize your brand based off of seeing an ad. Turning community into advocates is a super important one. I think it's one that often gets overlooked. A lot of businesses believe that the sale and that the life, uh, lifetime of a customer ends after the sale. That's in fact not true. The lifetime of a customer actually resets once they turn into an advocate. So the process that we usually take our, our clients through is, you know, how are you reaching them? Uh, and I should say lifestyle because I'm gonna life cycle because I'm gonna reference this term a little bit later. But how are you reaching them? How are you helping them make an informed decision on their purchase? How are you ultimately getting them to buy? And then after they've purchased, how are you getting them to speak about that interaction online and and really become an advocate for your brand? And then I, what I already touched on below that is, is driving leads. You know, in, in an industry like real estate, we understand there's a long nurture process in a, in a lead like that one, where sometimes people could be inquiring while they're still seven, to, seven months to a year out of making a, a decision. Uh, we want to be able to acquire the information and send them details of properties in the area and send them things that will help them be informed so that they can make a, a qualified purchase when the time comes. And also just nurturing them and building that relationship with them. Okay, so now that you have figured out who you're targeting and what your goals are, you need to identify what platforms you should be on and the posting frequency. So Mark kind of touched on this a little bit when he showed you the profile of Adrian and let you know what profiles, or sorry, what platforms he spends the most time on. I see it all too often where people try to be on every single platform because that's what they think they're supposed to be doing when that is not the case. When I was in university, my professor talked about the fact that you wouldn't go to a party where you don't know anyone or there's no one there that you want to talk to. So think about your social media profiles like that. You want to make sure that if you're spending the time and energy to create content on specific platforms that it's actually going to reach your target audience. So the most important thing here is to figure out what platforms your target audience is on and then work on building out your profiles on those platforms. I usually recommend two to three platforms to focus on. 
if you're feeling stretched for time, go for the, the, the lower portion, do two platforms. But if you have a team that is able to support with your social media content, then by all means, choose three. The frequency for each platform varies and it's kind of on a case by case basis. If you do a quick Google search, you'll find a list of posting frequencies that are recommended on all of the platforms here. But if you take anything away from this slide, it's that you don't need to be on all of them. You just need to be on the right ones. When we work with clients and we're building out a content strategy, we focus on content pillars. So there's a lot of different terms out there that also correlate to content pillars like areas of focus or just content ideas. But we always recommend that you pick five areas of focus that you want to center your content around. So think about how you can share the product or service, the process, the progress, the issues. There are so many cases where I've seen businesses posting about what they're selling, which is great. That is definitely supposed to be one area of focus, but people keep coming back to your platform because there's value. You need to be able to provide educational resources about your specific industry. You should be sharing company updates. These are all things that can be really great pieces of content that are going to help you build your community without coming off like you're you're constantly trying to sell to your audience. Of course, that is the end goal. We need to get people buying from us in order for our business to even be viable, but it's so much more than that. To give you an example, this is a content pillar breakdown I created for a skincare and beauty store in my hometown. So their whole business is focused on providing sustainable and eco-friendly beauty and skincare products to their audience. And their audience is actually stretched all across Canada because they have an e-commerce store. So when it came to building out their content strategy, we focused on their three main areas of products that they sell. Beauty, focusing on makeup and um, like accessories. Bath and Body, which is focused more on soap and lotion, and then self-care, which is kind of all-encompassing. They have candles, um, face masks, things like that. But then we also wanted to really highlight promos and collabs as part of our content strategy because we found that the content that resonated with the audience the most was user-generated content, content that was created by people that were actually buying the products and using them. So this looks like a lot of influencer partnerships to really make sure people, I guess the majority of people or a lot of people on the internet are directly correlating that content with this particular client. And then back when the pandemic wasn't happening, they were doing in-person events, they were doing makeup consultations, things like that. And that is something that they wanna continue doing but now it's kind of in a virtual sense. But that's another pillar of content where they're constantly promoting the events that they're running and providing some fun, engaging tips and tricks for their audience as it relates to the industry that they're in. So Kirsten, we got a really great question here from yeah. Andrew. Uh, would you include something like having your own website as being social media or only platforms such as Twitter, TikTok, et cetera? I think you're, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, I feel like this is maybe more your area of expertise, but I would say that social media is anywhere that you can be social with your audience, anywhere that they are following you to engage. And then I would say your website is more like you're in part of your entire digital presence. I love that. I, I, I agree. And I think you hit it perfectly. Businesses have forgotten over the last little while how important the social part of social media is. And we're seeing that come back around where the engagement has to be reciprocated from the business equally as much as the audience um, uh, in order for you to really uh, beat the algorithm, if you will. I don't like really using that term but, uh, term, but I think that's super important. So you might look at something like a blog that has a forum section or you know, a website that, that has uh, an area that customers can engage uh, with your business. Certainly, I'll put that in the social media platform. I also just attribute usually like creating content uh, to have some sort of correlation to social media. So 
Um, yeah, great question. I hope that uh, I hope that answers it. Yeah, I think another thing to add here is that we've seen before with like previous clients that people are asking questions on the social media platforms and they're not getting a response. And then that kind of puts a gap between them and your business. So now they're having a little bit of reluctance. They're feeling a little bit maybe distant with your brand and that's not a good look overall. So Mark's point of like being social on social media, it is something that people have forgotten. They've started using automated platforms to publish their content and they think that that's enough it's not enough. And not having the right community management strategy can actually be detrimental to your business, which we'll get to in a little bit. So once you have established the content pillars and you know kind of what areas you are going to create content in, you have to actually create the content, which sounds super surprising, but a lot of people do the strategy part and then they forget about the content because they don't have time to create it. When you are outlining your content pillars, I always recommend just opening a Google Sheet or even creating a chart on a piece of paper, putting at the top of the chart the five areas of focus or the five content pillars, and then brain dumping a ton of ideas that you can create within that column or that pillar. So for example, with the skincare um, and beauty brand, content that we created for them is very simple. How to take care of your skin through the ages, uncomplicate your skincare routine in these three steps. These are all pieces of content that are super valuable to the audience. But at the end of the day, there's a call to action that prompts them to check out the website or learn more about the products that they offer. This is actually, okay, I might be a little biased here, but this is my favorite part because you get to let your creativity run wild or even let somebody on your team kind of spearhead this portion of the strategy, just find ways that you can reach your audience and brainstorm all of those different ideas into some type of document. And then from there, you're going to create the content. When it comes to creating content, it's important to remember that the first piece of content you create is not going to go viral. It is not going to, I mean, if you're creating a reel or a TikTok, maybe it will, but traditional forms of content typically take time to kind of build up and get your reputation well known in order for people to engage with your content and want to share it with their friends. Content creation is a game of trial and error. It's about trying a bunch of different content ideas, figuring out which ones work, which ones really stick with your audience, what posts are they saving and sharing? What posts are they liking and commenting on and taking those analytics to see what's working and what's not and then running with the things that are working and ditching the things that aren't. I guess it's also important to note here that sometimes something, if something doesn't work right now, this year, this month, that's not to say that it's not going to work next year um, a couple months from now, so on and so forth. So keep all of those ideas you have on the back burner and uh, just kind of roll with it. Once you have your chart or your list of content ideas, now you need to figure out how you're going to share that content. Is it going to be a video? Are you going to create a blog post or an article? Are you going to hire a photographer to get some really great product shots? Are you going to record a podcast episode? Do you need to create a quote graphic or lyrics? Are you going to convert that content into a downloadable guide or something that you can use as a lead magnet? Are you going to go live on Instagram or Facebook or even Twitch or Clubhouse? There are so many different ways that you can create content now. And some ideas work really well in one format, but maybe don't work so well in another format. And you need to kind of play around with it to figure out what's going to stick. On the next slide, I am, correction, in a couple of slides, I will break down the Gary V content model, which will help probably ease your mind and make you feel a little bit better about the fact that you now need to create all of this content. Some examples here specific to a B2B industry. And as you're building out your product or your service that you are offering, show the behind the scenes. The behind the scenes are what going, 
that's what's going to kind of get investors interested in what you're building. It's going to be what shows people and gets people starting to believe in your product or your service. And it's going to help connect you as the founder or a member of the founding team connect with your audience deeper. As you're going through your journey, show throwbacks. Show what it was like the very first day that you decided you were going to start your business or the very first day that you started brainstorming names. Go back right to the beginning and show people what that process looks like. If you are planning on launching something, build hype around it. Reveal it, but tease it a little bit. Let people become hungry for what you're offering. Do interviews and connect with your audience. Obviously do collaborations with other people that are in your industry that are interested in talking about your product or your service. Share clips repurposed from Instagram lives and podcast interviews. And then sometimes play on the fun element. Play into those trends specifically on TikTok and Reels without steering too far away from your overall brand presence and, and your brand identity. Make sure it makes sense. So this is just an example from that beauty brand that I was talking about, swipe series, reels, Instagram stories. Um, and as I said here, don't be afraid to try a bunch of different styles and see which types of posts work really well for you. On LinkedIn, so these are a couple examples of founders that have shared things in the past on LinkedIn. Leverage your personal LinkedIn account. Something I will say is that company pages don't perform as well as personal LinkedIn pages. So if you're trying to build up the momentum on your LinkedIn page, make sure you are sharing the content from that page on your personal LinkedIn and building your profile there, building up your connections so that more people will in turn follow the company page, but it never from what I've seen, it never starts with the company page. It always starts with the founder's LinkedIn profile and anyone else who is on your team. So these are a few examples here. Okay, so the Gary V content model has literally changed how stressed I was about creating content. And the entire premise of it is that you can create, say, four to five long form pieces of content, or this example shows one, but long form pieces of content like YouTube videos, blogs, anything that takes a lot of time and energy to create, the content model tells you that you can take that long, long form piece of content and convert it into short form pieces of content. So the best example I can provide is if you are creating a blog on your website, and it is a step-by-step -step process. You're giving the seven tips as to why you should, something related to your industry. I'm obviously not, I'm stuck on an idea right now, but you would take those seven tips and convert that into a social media profile. Uh, sorry, a social media piece of content. So that could be a swipe series. You could do a video on it, but there's so many times where I see people creating content and then they just let it sit in the ghost land of their website without actually directing people to that piece of content or repurposing it in some other way. I will tell you that creating content takes time and creating really good content is, is hard. It's hard. And the time and energy, like I said, that you put into creating these pieces of content you don't want to have that time and energy wasted and you want to do whatever you can to leverage that piece of content you created and make sure that you're connecting with your audience. And then, of course, once you've created those short form pieces of content, share those on the social media profiles and the social media platforms that you chose in your social media strategy. Like I said, I see so many people creating blogs, but then they never share that blog on social media. And there's sometimes they don't even share it in a newsletter. So how are people finding that blog content? Especially if you started building your social media profiles before you started really implementing a blog as part of your content strategy. So I hope this kind of helps you feel a little bit better about creating content. Um, I would say you should be creating two to three pieces of content per week on these platforms. That's a very general statement because, like I said before, each platform is different, but 
this should help you when it comes to creating that content. Okay, so now that the content is created, you're sharing it on social media, it's time to build a community. This, like Mark said before, is the part that a lot of people skip out on. They don't see the value or maybe they're not exactly sure how to build a community, but we're gonna walk you through that today. Once you share content on social media, the next step is to engage with the community that you are building on these platforms. So your community doesn't just include your potential customers or your current customers. It includes all of the people that are following you, your local community in the geographic area that you're in, charitable organizations, your partners, your peers, friends and family, basically anyone who is showing any interest whatsoever in what you're doing and engaging with them on a regular basis and building those relationships with them. So how do you do this? Anytime someone comments on your post or sends you a direct message on these social media platforms, you should be responding back to them. Let them know that you're accessible. Let them know that you're there to support them. Engage in Facebook groups, Reddit threads, and forums. This is something we've actually been doing more of in the last quarter, I would say. There are so many really great conversations happening about your industry on platforms like Reddit and Quora that you could be participating in. You could be giving people directly the answers that they're searching for, even though they're not actually searching for you and your brand, but indirectly, they're gonna follow you. They're going to have that recognition of your brand and that's gonna to contribute to their purchase journey. Foster relationships in Slack channels. If you are someone um, that has a business that is building a community in Slack, make sure you're fostering the relationships there. I see this happen a lot with courses that people are in. They will create a Slack community, but then once the course is done, the conversation kind of ends and the groups go stagnant. Don't let that happen. Keep the momentum going because like Mark said before, even after the purchase has happened, those people are now going to become advocates for you. So you wanna let them know that you still care about them even after they've already made a purchase from you. And lastly, build relationships with potential partners or influencers. Influencer marketing is huge right now. It has been for the past couple of years and I anticipate it will be as we move into this next decade, but people are not dumb. They know when they're being sold on social media, they know when they're seeing an ad and it takes more now to convince them to buy and for their, their like fake meter to not go up. Um, that's why people are partnering with influencers because it's a more authentic way of getting your product or service in the eyes of your target audience without coming out and being like, hey, I'm trying to sell this to you. So I'm gonna hand this over to Mark. I feel like I've been talking forever, but um, if you have a social media presence now, we need to talk about how you're going to grow it. Awesome, thank you, Kirsten. And I'm gonna uh, touch on a couple of the great questions we got in the chat, um, maybe defer some your way. But I wanna go back to one thing Kirsten said about perhaps the Reddit forums. You, you have to remember that and this gets into what I'm going to talk about on the coming slides. People are online seeking out information about their next purchase at completely different stages in that journey. And when you look at something like targeting someone with a Facebook ad, the intent, even though you're using enhanced targeting to reach them, the intent is very low. You can reach 70,000 people and convert two purchases in that time. When somebody goes to Google to search up something, they may have a question that involves a certain keyword. They're demonstrating a higher level intent of intent. So yes, it could be more competitive to be in that space, uh, but at the same time, it could yield higher conversion rates, and better, ultimately better results. When someone's on Reddit or in forums or in community groups and they're seeking out information and they're prepared to wait to get that information because they want it right from the source or they want to hear what other people are doing, I would say that's just about the highest level of intent that someone can demonstrate in making, you know, sourcing out that final, those final bits of information to make an informed purchase. To give you an example, um, referral sites for most of my clients represent the highest conversion rate. Referral sites can be anything from uh, like third-party publications, 
uh, it, forums. Sometimes those are classified as social media platforms, but forums are often fall into that category. And just last month, maybe 10 users generated a purchase, whereas Facebook needed uh, 1,100 to do so over that same amount of time. Um, these are just some things to consider when it comes to fostering that community, which, which nowadays is all the more important. Uh, we're going to quickly, but thanks, Kirsten. That was very insightful. Um, so we're going to address a couple of questions here. Uh, Lisa asked, is it better to just follow up, uh, focus on a small group that you have rather than always trying to grow? And I actually have, you know, a great, uh, I, I call anybody who I invest a lot of time uh, researching and learning from a peer. I, 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 I learned that uh, from a few podcasts that I listened to, but Seth Godin is an entrepreneur and uh, best-selling author, wrote The Purple Cow, which is a great business book for those who are, who are seeking out more reads like that one. Um, he talks a lot about the smallest viable market. And I'm going to try and paint a picture for you. If you treated it like a Venn diagram, where on the left side, your right side, whatever it looks like, um, there is the minimum uh, category. And then on the right side, there is uh, let's, I'm just going to pull this one up so that I remember what it was. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, viable. So minimum and viable. Uh, if you're all the way to that left side, your audience is too small. It's too niche. You're not reaching enough people. If you're all the way to the right side, which is just a viable audience that could convert, you're too broad. So finding that area in between to really target the people who are uh, likely to buy can sustain your business plan and demonstrating high intent. I think Lisa, that could answer your question is trying to identify the smallest uh, or the minimum viable market. Hope that answers your Thanks. question. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, so a tool to manage all of this, uh, Kirsten, this was when you were speaking about publishing to uh, different platforms. So mm -hmm. I know that you know within our company, we use a project management tool in Notion. But then we also use a auto publishing tool called Agora Pulse. I'll say Agora Pulse does not substitute a social media manager. Uh, it simply saves time in allowing you to publish certain pieces of content that don't require, uh, let's say, an enhanced level of detail as you're posting it, like thumbnail, th some thumbnails and things like that. Uh, you need to be on the platform. And Instagram uh, platforms like Instagram want to calculate how much you're engaging and keeping people on the platform. Uh, that that will ultimately affect your algorithm as a brand. So um, those are tools to help you manage it, but uh, don't don't uh, I'd be remiss if I told you that they could replace a social media manager altogether. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. Like these tools are there to help you execute, but there's nothing out there currently. I don't know what the future of robots is and like AI, but um, there's nothing out there that's going to develop you the perfect strategy without having someone who knows about social media and about growth marketing um, to kind of support you with that. So by all means, if you're looking to save time with the strategy that you've developed, then go for it. But like Mark said, you have to be on the platforms engaging with your audience. Don't just schedule content in there at whatever time they recommend that you do it and then don't engage back with the community that's there asking questions. Um, and a lot of these platforms also don't allow you to schedule stories, which should be part of your content strategy um, mm. because they are, they show people a little bit more of a behind the scenes and let people know um, kind of what you're doing within the last 24 hours, which is exciting to some of your audience, um, but these platforms most likely don't allow you to schedule those. So you'll have to be actually on the platform doing it. Definitely. My, my, if my conversations over the past four years with hundreds of business owners serve me, I can imagine that there's a few of you in this, uh, in this set, in this meeting here that are saying, well, does this mean that I need to be spending my time as a business owner on these platforms constantly you know, engaging with customers. And I would say treat, uh, you know, as you would develop out your sales and marketing process, uh, attribute time and resources to things like building processes for engaging with people on social media. You know, we've, we don't, we don't sit there and start from zero every time we need to answer a question for a, a potential customer, create things like quick links and uh, different frequently asked question guides. And this can be something that if you're a service-based industry that your receptionist can, can take on for an increased, uh, slightly increased hourly wage. There's a lot of solutions that you could kind of have as mitigating uh, solutions, but 
Um, something that, you know, we're not just saying dedicate a certain amount of hours every day to always be responsive. It's, it's a matter of treating it the same way you would establish any other processes for your business. If, would you agree with that, Kirsten? For sure. Awesome. So growing your social media, obviously a lot of you have heard about utilizing hashtags. The question is, do they work? Uh, I see some more questions came through, but we're, we're going to get to those a little bit later. So thank you for, for continuing to ask. want to make sure we're moving along here as well. Um, uh, do the hashtags work? Don't they work? Perhaps Kirsten, you can give us like a quick on, on utilizing hashtags. What are your thoughts there and how have they changed over the years? Yeah. I mean, when Instagram first released hashtags, that's kind of where they say that Instagram created the hashtag, the idea of hashtags. They said that you should be using 30 on every single post. Um, 30 is the maximum that you're actually able to use um, or else your post won't get published. But right now with the latest update that we've received directly from Facebook and Instagram is that you should be using between eight to 15 um, and making sure that they're not super generic, but actually kind of niche down. So when we work with clients, we typically choose three different buckets, highly competitive, moderately competitive, and like low competition. And to kind of put that into perspective and not like a social media manager's terms, um, we're talking about when you use a hashtag, it links to a separate page that shows you all of the posts that are associated with that hashtag. And if you're using a hashtag like startup, there's going to be thousands and thousands of posts that are hashtagged with the hashtag startup every single second every mm -hmm. single minute so mm -hmm. getting your post recognized there is going to be a little bit more challenging so have a mix of like low competition moderate competition and high competition hashtags within that 8 to 15. just while we're on the topic daniel had a great question about the utilizing the band hashtags and making sure that you're avoiding doing that i know that you talk Ooh. quite a bit about that yes so there are hashtags that are banned on instagram that when used will give you a bad like profile score and hinder your future posts moving forward, but also it won't make that post visible to anybody outside of your current following. Sometimes it doesn't even allow your post to show up in your feed. So if you are building out hashtag groups, do a search on, I think you can use a, like an app like hashtag generator. I believe that's the one, um, but you can just Google it and say list of banned hashtags and make sure that the hashtags you're using aren't banned. If a hashtag page on Instagram gets consumed by too many posts that go against Instagram's community standards, are inappropriate, or um, have just been kind of abused, they'll classify it as a banned hashtag. And you can find this if you go to search up the hashtag and it tells you at the top that posts associated with this hashtag are being hidden. It'll tell you and you'll know. Um, but we ran into this issue with a men's health company that we were working on and some of the hashtags because of the sensitivity of the industry were naturally banned um, and you just have to go in and make sure that you're checking your hashtags to ensure that they're not working against you instead of working for you because that's the whole point awesome yeah thank you for that um, I get this question a lot. Uh, how can paid advertising help increase my organic social media growth? And there are very simple ways of looking at this, like Facebook allows you to run an ad directly to generate likes. Although I'd say, make sure you turn off audience expansion if you're going to be doing that, because then it'll just present your people, uh, your, uh, uh, your ads to not necessarily the most viable audience. And when you target, it goes and just thinks that it's going to expand and show it to more people. But if you're only servicing a certain area, that could cause a problem. So there are ways to do that directly, uh, indirectly by running brand awareness campaigns and offering some sort of value in the, in the ad, uh, encouraging people that they want to give them some sort of reason to say, hey, you know, you've seen me go back to my profile. I offer tons of value to customers, whether that's in the form of a good laugh, uh, inspiration, or one of the most valuable types would be obviously education. Um, that's going to really encourage people that you're reaching just once or twice to come back to your profile and look for more information that way. I get the question a lot. Uh, how much should I be spending? I would recommend, so I'll, I'll, I'll break it down into two parts. 
there's no simple answer. B2B businesses that are at a stagnant growth and are looking to just service existing employees and grow at a moderate to low rate, you know, 2% of your gross revenue is an acceptable amount. But if you're somebody that's trying to be aggressive uh, online and trying to scale very quickly and in the B2C category, um, you might be considering pushing that more towards 12 to 14% of your gross revenue. Um, but those are kind of like that wide range that exists there. I will also make the recommendation that boosting posts should not be your only advertising, paid advertising strategy on, on, on Facebook and Instagram. Create a business manager. It's relatively straightforward entering in basic information and updating your credit card info. And it allows you to create a much more detailed audience, uh, detailed targeting, adjust which placements you want your ads to be shown in, depending on what format your ad is, like what size of it. And if it's a video, it's going to appear better in certain placements. Um, spend time in the business manager creating your ads. And then if you are going to boost posts to increase engagement and overall awareness, it should be about 10 to 15% of your overall Facebook and Instagram advertising budget. Um, but, but certainly no more than that, just because the opportunities are limited uh, in that in that category. So just using that as a sole advertising option. Lastly, we have influencer partnerships here. So I'll break this down even further into collaborations. I think this over the past several years, especially uh, given the fact that it's been, you know, due to COVID been increasingly difficult to get into a store, be face-to-face -face and build a certain amount of trust and credibility with an audience, partnerships have become all the more important. This doesn't necessarily just mean that I send my product and money to an influencer and they post about me. This can extend to something like BlogTO. Um, when we talk about target audiences, we talk about three different types. Uh, where, you know, you say you have your direct competitors. These are people who are going to appear in the exact same Google search as you at targeting the exact same clients. Your indirect competitors who might be a much further ahead business, larger or smaller, but there's still information you could take from their processes and their data. And then there's attention overlap competitors. So for example, uh, if I'm a restaurant marketing in the GTA, BlogTO has a lot of attention for somebody like me. And I might want to consider getting involved in one of their top pizza spot lists. I might want to consider getting a third party to write about me because those types of things are going to build a ton of credibility, not only in the short term, like an influencer campaign would, but also in the long term and uh, the SEO value that that provides. Continue oh. on, Kirsten. Sorry, my Bluetooth keyboard disconnected. No <laughs> Looks like we had Anthony hop off, uh, but uh, I will answer his question uh, just before the end of the presentation so that he can review the recording. We'll get to all of the ones here. Um, generating leads. I think we've talked to this to some extent. Uh, Facebook lead generation ads are a valuable yet uh, difficult to scale form of uh of lead generation tactic on Facebook and Instagram. This is gonna be the one where you click on the ad and you see that your, your information is basically populated into it. LinkedIn has a really great form of this where uh, somebody wants to continue reading through an article or download a resource guide and they need to enter in their information. This is based off of the fact that most customers like I mentioned earlier need to touch you about seven to 11 times before they're gonna make a purchase on average. So that frequency has to really increase. But once we've got their information, we could include them in our customer relationship management or lead management system. And uh, we can hit them up a lot more, uh, ultimately encouraging them, building that relationship and building that trust. I think I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about CRM briefly here. Uh, I think before you start to get into pe any paid ad campaigns, take a look at your life cycle marketing model. And uh, it's a little bit small to read, but uh, I understand we're gonna get copies of this presentation. So I'll just try and break it down for you. Early on in a buyer's journey, that's when they're unlikely to make a purchase. They're just doing simple research, or maybe they haven't even thought about the product at all, but they've seen a Facebook ad or uh, they drove by a billboard on the way home from work. That's where you're just simply reaching them. You're touching them for the very first time. When we're trying to get them to act and sort of engage with our brand in any way, we're doing things that will increase the consideration value. We're you know, showing them a testimonial. We're building trust through a chatbot. We might be engaging with them in the DMs. I saw somebody wrote, 
in my experience, DMs are, are currency here. And that's in fact true. I, I think DMs are incredibly valuable from, from the sense that it also improves the, the rate at which that person is going to see your content when they log into Instagram. The people who you direct message are more likely to see your posts. Um, so that's, that's a really important factor. Then you have convert where, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of people think that journey ends, but there's value there. Once you start looking at the lifetime value of a customer, you can eventually turn them into a repeat customer. You can upsell, you can cross sell. And that's where CRM really comes into play is that act to convert category there. They haven't had enough information to make a decision. Now they're entered on our email list. They're going to get access to new promotions and, and guides and things like that to help them become informed. Once they convert, how did you enjoy your purchase? Uh, what could we have done differently? I know all of my clients, uh, it's almost mandated that we institute some sort of customer feedback process so that we can at least let customers know they're being heard, if not for anything else. And the most important one, which is constantly make decisions within the business that directly impact our customers. Uh, the last one is how can we continue to engage them? You might look at loyalty programs, referral programs, uh, you know, uh, like I said, upselling or even cross-selling. These are ways that you're going to want to explore through CRM to get customers to become, uh, to deliver your business more value over their life cycle. So I will, I, I think they, everybody gets access to this. If not, uh, you can reach out to me for a chart like this one, and I'm, I'm happy to provide it. Um, but uh, if there are any questions on that, we'll get to them at the end as well. Okay. So I'm going to just touch on these briefly because I already have, but like Kirsten's content models, uh, you're going to want to look at ways that you could generate more value and, and uh, in turn, get more leads off of social media. So create a value add, give people a reason to extend the relationship beyond just that momentary space of mind uh, occupying situation. Like we need to uh, stay in their head. We need to give them more reasons to come back and offering things like resource guides uh, can really aid in doing that. Be accessible. I've been talking about this quite a bit. It's, it's based off of the premise that 10 years ago, there was a whole lot of people that were already comfortable buying online. They were early adapters and they didn't have a problem researching information, feeling confident in doing so. Um, but there was a certain percentage of people that did not quite get behind it. They liked shopping for the experience. They wanted to tell people that that's what they did on the weekend for whatever reason it was. COVID kind of accelerated the percentage growth of people that were going to be shopping online. And those people who are reluctant but now needed to craved accessibility. They wanted Google to implement direct messaging through Google My Business, which they did. They wanted... Uh, they wanted WhatsApp to become a thing, a call to action that you can include in apps. They want chatbots to be 99% universal across all B2C websites, pretty much. Uh, and they want to engage uh, at a high rate in the DMs. So being accessible is incredibly important. Webinars are a great way to get feedback from existing customers. Uh, also, just uh, host instructional walkthroughs for a software as a service product. There's lots of ways that you can reach your customers uh, and encourage upsell and cross-sell opportunities by hosting live webinars and virtual events. Testimonials build credibility. It's as simple as that. I always say that if you can get somebody to talk about your business online, you can get a new customer. So I'm really big on pushing testimonials, whether it be from our question earlier on your website or on your social media. Um, and then frequency. I think I've said this probably about four or five times throughout the presentation, but uh, you have to increase the frequency rate in which you're interacting with people and don't just publish a, an ad through your boosted posts on Instagram and expect that that's going to generate you revenue. People will see it, perhaps engage with it at a three to 4% rate uh, and then completely move on. So remarketing is a really valuable form of doing that but also utilizing the free CRM tools that your business has access to like constant contact or MailChimp, depending on your email size list. I'm sure we'll likely have some questions there. Uh, but yeah, maybe Mark, I'll just wrap up with the tools sure. since that's the last piece and then we'll go into the Q and A. Um, so I know we kind of talked about this already, but recommended tools. These are some of the ones that we have used in the past the most frequently. So we mentioned before that we use Agora Pulse for scheduling. Sometimes this isn't a sustainable tool for someone that's not an agency. So you can use other tools like HubSpot or Buffer, which come at a little bit of a lower cost um, and maybe don't have the same 
features, but will still do the job the same. If you have no design background and you're looking to create some type of content that's branded, use Canva, super user-friendly tool. Um, if you're not looking for something that can be made in Photoshop or Illustrator, then by all means, Canva can do the job. $80 is an online engagement tool that basically Gary Vaynerchuk created the $80 strategy where you would pick 10 hashtags and go leave your two cents on the top nine posts in that hashtag, thus creating a dollar 80. This website gives you the ability to do all of that right on the platform versus having to log into Instagram on your phone. Um, BuzzSumo is something that um, gives you trending topics that you can talk about, things that you can kind of piggyback off of to create content that is, like I said, trending. And then if you're looking for tools to find domain names, you can obviously use Shopify. Obviously Shopify is also there to help you build websites, but these are kind of the tools that we use the most frequently. I'm not sure, Mark, if you have any additional ones that you wanna add, but um, I think this is a pretty good high level overview. I think as a project management tool, we've really mm -hmm. adapted Notion as an organization, just super customizable, very interactive. You can have guest members on your board. So if you're an agency and you work with clients, it's, it's a really powerful tool. Um, thank you, Kirsten, for, yeah. for getting us on that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I'm a big uh, fan of Notion. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I think, are we getting, are we ready to get into yeah. some questions? Awesome. Yeah, that's it. So I'm going to exit the screen share and then we can just kind of talk face to face. Okay, so earlier in the presentation, I'm just going to pull up the chat here. Uh, what percentage of content needs to be new and can you recycle content that you've published previously? So I'll let you answer this one. I also do have some thoughts on it. Yeah, um, absolutely. You can repurpose content. Um, I also believe it's beneficial for SEO if you've created blogs from a couple of years ago to recreate those and make sure they're up to date. But truthfully, people see so much content every single day, they're not going to remember if you've shared that post before. I forget what the stat is, but I want to say it's like 300 feet of content is what people are scrolling through on social media. And I, I feel like this was literally like a couple of years ago. So I guarantee you it's more now. <laughs> but no one is going to remember mm -hmm. if you've shared something three months ago. So yes, repurpose it. Um, the percentage of new content. I mean, this all comes back to the trial and error phase and like making sure that you're testing out new pieces of content, new captions, new creative to see what really sticks. So often awesome. is yeah, my yeah. recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I think that's music to everyone's ears there. <laughs> I will say when you're considering blog writing, just one thing to be careful about, 75% uh, of the content can't match word for word uh, or else it identifies as duplicate and can actually end up harming your SEO. But if you reword it, there's, there's things you can do called like spinning the articles, just, just jumbling up a little bit there and, uh, that should solve that problem for you, but something to look out for, certainly. I saw Lisa, you came unmuted there. Did you have a question that, that you wanted to oh, get Oh, I was to? just gonna invite people to ask their questions, that's all. <laughs> we have a few more on the chat that if we, if we wanna get through. Sure. Um, so it says, uh, Winnie asked, uh, if you use Facebook or IG, there is a Facebook, oh, oh. okay. So that, that's, uh, that seems like she's answering the question there. Uh, yes, Anthony mentioned building relationships. Uh, it happens in the DMs and we completely agree. Uh, I will, I do want to say something here because I see it happen all too often. Try your best not to use some type of automated service to do direct outreach through DMs. I don't know how many times I get people sending me a message that's not personalized at all, or it says hello, and then my username, like that it's just, it's not a good look. So spend the time to actually create a personalized message. Sometimes it's even better if you send a voice note or a video message. I cannot tell you how many times I've done that and that converted into a sale or working on a retainer package with someone because I gave them more than just a text message. You know what I mean? So um, definitely avoid the automated messages. If you get 
a huge influx of inquiries on your social media platforms and you can't get to them within 24 hours, by all means, set up an automated message that says, hey, thank you so much for your message. Sorry, I can't get to you right now. If this is urgent, give us a call. If not, we'll get back to you in 48 hours. That's fine. But if you're actually having a conversation with someone, do not start it with an automated message. Only thing to add there is authenticity wins. I, I really do believe that. Um, if you're a brand that is clearly outside of your comfort zone, just trying to appeal to a specific demographic, you know, I, I like living outside the comfort zone a little bit, but if it's inauthentic and, and, it, and it really comes across that way, you can actually end up harming your brand reputation more than, than doing it any good. So recognize who your target audience is, how they like to be spoken to and, and be authentic. Because I think every positive experience that I've had with brands recently, especially during the pandemic has been, you know, I, I place an order and I get a personalized message from the owner um, that's saying like, thank you so much for, for supporting us. Like that goes such a long way. I'm, the odds that I share that if even just with my, my marketing team internal chat, then you know, that, that it's really high and it goes a long way. So authenticity, it's really important to, to remain authentic. I will say too, that if Gen Z is part of your target audience, they have a very, like their BS meter, they yeah. know when they're, then when they're being sold, even through influencer partnerships, sometimes it can almost go in the wrong direction if you're not partnering with the right influencer. So they're all about building connections and they value experience over the actual product and service itself. Keep that in mind and make sure that you're delivering a great experience, whether they're just interacting with you for the first time or this is their fifth purchase. Awesome. We have some time for any more questions. Does anyone have any more questions? Anything that jumped out during the presentation we want to touch on? I have a question. Sorry. Um, oh, that's okay. Go ahead. Oh, so I'm working for a startup. It's a data privacy startup. And I'm not sure if they know how, how do you allocate budget for social media advertising? I know you guys kind of broadly went over a little bit of percentage with the actual um, advertising for, I think it was Instagram. But um, as far as figuring out which social media advertisements or, or like which system is better? Like is Facebook or it's, I've, hear, I've heard a lot of different kind of aspects of Facebook being better and or Instagram being kind of on the loose end of utilizing your budget. So. So if you're talking specifically about running ads uh, and what, what platform these ads or placements these ads should live on. Like, I think we're looking at 17 to 21 different placements between Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram, potential placements. I would suggest, and it's, it might not necessarily be the answer that you're looking for, but I would suggest utilizing uh, the AB testing uh, model mm -hmm. in, in different, across different variables. And what I mean by that is you know, uh, you're creating an ad set. So I don't know how involved you are in the process, but you're creating an ad set that is going to test against the, you know, the platform. Uh, what I see a lot of people do is they'll actually create the ad and then they'll select Instagram only. And then they'll create another ad and they'll select Facebook only. I wouldn't recommend going about it this way because your interpretation of the data is now, you're now relying on your interpretation of the data rather than a qualified A-B test from the platform itself. So uh, I would say use the A-B test tool. Now, when you talk about budget, unfortunately, you're not going to get even close to a 95, 90 to 95% efficiency rating in your A-B test if you don't spend at least $500 over two weeks, like a minimum of two weeks. So those are just a couple of things to consider. Um, but when you're using the business manager, I would say, look at it on a campaign basis and uh, establish what your control variable is if you're really still in the testing phase and then utilize the A-B test uh, feature within the, within the, within the app. Uh, because I've seen a lot of people make mistakes selecting placements and then it really, you don't know if it's serving to the right audience during that manual placement 
And that's where it could present a whole bunch of uh, inaccurate data. Does that kind of answer your question? No, definitely. Thank you. Awesome. We do have a question here in the chat from Louise. So I use Instagram as my primary social media platform. Would you recommend I create content pillars as my highlights? I definitely think this is a good place to start, but I would encourage you to look at highlights in this way. When people come to your profile, they're showing intent because either they saw your post in the explore page or someone has shared your post and they've come across your account somehow. People will watch your highlights as a way to binge watch your content to see if they want to work with you or purchase what you're trying to sell. So I have in the past used the content pillars as highlights, but I also want to make sure that there is a how to order or how to purchase highlight. Um, I work with a bakery and this is so important because they get so many questions about how people can order custom cakes. And that's the thing that they get asked the most often. So now we just forward them the highlight or let, or direct them there. Other things that you might want to share are testimonials, things that you're sharing to your story that people are going to see whenever they log into the app, make a whole highlight for that. Um, and then have one that outlines your services or your products that goes into a little bit more detail. And then if you are someone who is kind of the face behind your brand, make a highlight for that too. Make a highlight that shows the process, who you are, build the connection so that even if people aren't like, oh my gosh, I need this product or service today, they want to support you because it's you and you've been real and authentic with them about your journey. Like truthfully, I've bought so many products over the years from people that I've connected with online that I didn't need, but I wanted to show support to them in some capacity. And it was because of how authentic they were on their platforms. So if you're feeling stuck on a place to start, then by all means, choose your content pillars. But those are some other ones that I would highly recommend that you include as well. Awesome. You're welcome. Great. So Do we have any other questions? Well, I have one. We have uh, at Ed quite a few people in startup mode um, and budget's tight. Not everybody can afford a social media manager. Any suggestions? There are so many resources online, so many that will be there to help you. Um, not to plug myself, but I write blogs about it. You can check out my website. <laughs> um, you can check out the King Street Media Instagram account, which shares tips and tricks constantly. Um, but honestly, sometimes all it takes is a quick Google search. Um, and then sitting with the content that we've provided you with today to really develop a strategy. And then that will help you um, in actually executing on the strategy. I think the only thing maybe I can add here is, but, uh, oh, oh, Winnie, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Great to uh, hear from you again. Um, I used to work at an agency uh, in a different life. And I guess Winnie was one of the reps that we worked with in field. So glad to speak cool. again. Cool. Um, yeah, so I think, sorry, lost, lost my train a little bit there, but uh, Kirsten said it earlier, it's not about being everywhere all at once. And I think if you go back to the very beginning of the presentation and you say, where is that smallest viable market? Where are they living? What problem am I trying to solve for them? And where can I allocate my time so that I can solve the most problems for those people? That's going to be where you're going to designate your attention. Um, but then I recommend that you just simply dedicate a few hours, maybe out of the month, uh, to be on the other platforms, to exist there, if not for anything other than a directory, so that when people search you on Google, that entire first page is occupied with uh, relevant information about your business and social media channels that you're publicly listed in um, that are acting as some SEO for you. So, you know, develop, I, I know one of our colleagues, Daniel, he talks about this all the time, uh, develop uh, these platforms so that when people stumble across you, it doesn't look like you're a vacant business that has boarded up windows, right? Just be there so that you have that public information accessible and then really only dedicate your time to where you're solving the toughest problems for the, for the best viable audience. I think a lot of people also feel like they're wasting time 
being on social media think of it like research because mm-hmm. that is directly where your your target audience is spending their time every day they could be in between meetings they're looking on social media they could be spending time before bed on their phone like it's research you are trying to get yourself into the minds of your target audience in hopes of being able to connect with them on a deeper level mm. so i'm business development okay so my focus is always how do we get the business growing and I know we've talked about lead generation on social media you talked about it a little bit but you know push comes to shove am I better off having a sales conversation or engaging on social interesting question (laughs) my my recommendation would be to systematize it the same way you would the business development division in my company we look at things we look at you know the major categories of our business as accounts dealing with customers, uh, sales and marketing and finance. Um, So we have systematized processes for all three major pillars of our business incorporated in that sales and marketing one is what is our social media strategy. And depending on the life cycle of your business, where you're at, the internal capabilities, sometimes businesses don't have people to take pictures of what's going on. So we'll never build a marketing plan that's just one size fits all. It really does depend on your internal capabilities. But if you're not utilizing the free resources that exist in even just public directories across all of these social media channels, you're you're not doing your, your business the best service possible. So I think uh, sales is, uh, is short term. It's going to drive you business. Of course, I think marketing works a little bit more for you, uh, and can sometimes be perceived in, in some instances as more long-term. Uh, but I, I encourage suggest the two work hand in hand. Of course. I think that you need yeah. both actually. Yeah, definitely. And they and I, really can't work independently. And I think the approach that the approach that we've been met with over the past four years at KSM has been very piecemeal. It's business owners coming to us and say, Mark, I need you to manage my Instagram account. Well, well, why? Mm. Like, do you, do you truly understand mm. why that's where you need to be? Or like, what process do you have that uh, that has indicated that what, what customers are you out there reaching? Like, mm-hmm. so really look at it the same way you would in biz dev is a perfect example because it's a very process oriented, uh, sector of the business for any company. So approach it the same way with sales and marketing is develop those so, processes. I'm going to ask, I know Ryan's had his hand up, so I'm going to turn to him in a second, but I just want to ask a quick question related to that. What's the fastest path to cash on social media? (laughs) How do we get the sale as fast as possible? If I had a direct, if I had an answer to that, uh, no, I, I, I'll tell you my thoughts on this. And that's kind of why we singled out lead generation is implement a strong customer relationship management process to build out a funnel so that when people find you on social media, they're more likely to actually convert. uh, Lisa, if you run an ad, that you have no way of, of a customer knowing even what they're supposed to do when they get to your website, that ad is obsolete. It will mean nothing and it won't give you any cash. But if you have, you can utilize a $50 budget 10X if you have a, an efficient CRM strategy so that somebody comes to your site, seeking out more information, they're entered in your email list. Now you have an opportunity, a direct line of contact to them. That's the best way is those lead generation campaigns that allow you a direct line of access to your customer on social media. And you can really get good value out of those. Anything to add, Kirsten? Um, I was just going to say that social media is not, it's not, it's not a quick scheme. Like it's, that's not the purpose of social media, which is why these tactics all need to work hand in hand. Because if you implement social media on its own without a way to, to capture these leads, you're missing out. If you're trying to capture the leads, but you're not using social or ads, you're not going to get the leads. Like it all works together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say at the end of the day, sorry, social media is like building relationships and doing research and then implementing those other tactics will help. Perfect. I want to go to Ryan. Ryan, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, lots, lots to take away here and, and learn. Um, and and thank you, Lisa. Earlier, you mentioned you know a lot of startups. Well, I've been in this particular business that I own for about five years. 
uh, brick and mortar, two locations, all that type of stuff. We've kind of been doing our own thing for social media. We're not the experts. I'm not the experts. I'm the owner of the business. Now I have Facebook and a few other things, but it's my kids that are, well, dad, why don't you have, you know, a, a Snapchat? I'm like, I need a Snapchat for, <laughs> for my business and, and different things like that. Do, do either of you offer almost like, I, I recognize that you provide services, but is there like an audit or a social media audit or anything that says, hey, let's look at what you're doing today. Um, here's a plan and with the potential to engage your services, here's our cost. Like, is there, is there an opportunity there? Because again, you talk about Canva, sure. I, I, I found that really easy to use. I was able to put a logo, throw a picture and I put a, a call to action on there, put it out on Instagram and it was great. And I got a couple likes on it. Um, but there's so much more that I think we're missing out on. So I think that that was kind of my question. Social media audit, um, sitting down with a company who doesn't have a marketing team or person and saying, here's how we can help. That's my question. I, I, yeah, I can go, <laughs> Kirsten, yeah. Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, in fact, we don't engage with any uh, business or client if, if, a, if a marketing plan, which includes an audit, is not performed first. I feel like far too often we're allocating funds and resources that are misdirected and misguided. And in fact, it could be detrimental to, to small businesses. So uh, we always do start with a marketing plan that includes a 12 month thematic calendar or a 12 month content calendar um, and budget included. Uh, but that also does include an audit to understand wh where your customers, like I've kind of been harping on throughout this presentation, we do offer that. I don't know what the line of communication is here, but if you'd like to reach out, you can reach out to us directly and I can provide you some more information. Sure. Thanks. And I believe there was another question in the chat here. Um, I hope so I saw uh, Winnie asked, I hope Winnie, we answered that question for you. Uh, I talked a little bit about lead generation ads and how you convert them into sales. Is implement, and I've used CRM a couple of times. So just to be clear, that can be anything from MailChimp to Constant Contact to Klaviyo. If you're on Shopify, I highly recommend Klaviyo. Um, but yeah, making sure that uh, you're greeting customers, acquiring their information as early on as possible in the process, greeting them before the purchase, right after the purchase, and then you know weeks later to, to uh, request reviews and feedback and things like that. I think that's a huge part of converting leads into sales. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm looking at Omar here, uh, just Omar's, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Ryan, well, thank you for providing that. But I'm looking at Omar here and that, that is the reality is that you have to remember when, I think this is a great place to leave it if there are no other questions, but a takeaway from this is what are most of you doing when you're using Instagram, right? It's a very incredibly passive platform. You're not on there specifically making your next major life decision. You're killing time in between meetings or you're, you know, uh, looking up information about a restaurant that you're going to go to. We're finding more customers nowadays are going to Instagram than uh Google to, to find out what to wear to a restaurant. So there's certain types of motive, um, but it's very, very passive. So it is a numbers game. And Kirsten alluded it to being a little bit of a longer term strategy. A lot of these conversations are going to fall short, but when you take interest in thinking human first for your business and solving a problem for them, you'll find that that conversion rate will start to creep up and build long-term long lasting relationships. Well, thank you, Mark. Kirsten, this has been an awesome session. I think uh, lots of great tips in here. Um, I came away inspired and, <laughs> and I appreciate all the advice you gave us. Um, so do you want to just pass? Um, I think we've, you've you indicated it in your slides, but is there some way that the uh, audience can get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, you can like I'm virtually on every platform as I preach. My my name's listed there. It's Mark Simone on Instagram. It has an underscore at the end of it. Um, but yeah, I, I I do love having conversations with small business owners, even that you know don't necessarily work within the budget that our agency sets out usually for minimum engagement. But we can happily have a have a conversation about some of your needs. So Kirsten wrote hers there. Uh, oh, that's actually yeah, that's our inbox. So that's probably the easiest way of going about it if you'd like to connect. Hello at kingstreetmedia.ca. There you go. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here. And thanks everyone for joining us this evening. I hope you got good value out of the session tonight. 
And we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks when we're talking about digital marketing and digital lead generation strategies. So a continuation of this topic. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us.